Well, it's so nice to be here amongst my sisters and brothers. I say sisters and brothers because there's more sisters than brothers, actually. So. <laughs> um, so the path of the modern mystic. <clears throat> and the title of this talk comes from the Mahatma Letters to A.P. Sinnott, letter number two. And it says, He who would lift up high the banner of mysticism and proclaim its reign near at hand must give the example to others. He or she must be the first to change his modes of life and regarding the study of the occult mysteries as the upper step in the ladder of knowledge must loudly proclaim it such despite exact science and the opposition of society. The kingdom of heaven is obtained by force, say the Christian mystics. It is but with armed hand and ready to either conquer or perish that the modern mystic can hope to achieve his object. So this sets us a very high ideal and not many of us can say we have the hardihood to follow this at the moment in our lives. But it is also very, very inspiring and gives us something to aim for. So it's nice to aim for, aim for something higher all the time. The Bhagavad Gita urges us to centre our attention on Krishna as the higher self. We have to make this our line of life meditation. In this highly materialistic and noisy society, noisy not only physically but on mentally as well, it is difficult to centre ourselves in the real self and hear the still small voice of our conscience. So what must we do? Earlier in the same letter just quoted from, the Master K.H. says, the adept is the rare efflorescence of a generation of inquirers. And to become one, he must obey the inward impulse of his soul, irrespective of the prudential considerations of worldly science and sagacity. So we, are, we may be a long way from being adepts. Well, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, there may be adepts here. I don't know. <laughs> um, but we should gradually be at least trying to follow this advice at our own particular level of understanding. So this is the way of the modern mystic, to listen to the dictates of our inner self, despite what the world throws at us to maintain our equilibrium amidst the turmoil of so-called civilization. This is why we need to study, <clears throat> to train and to meditate. Well, the general view of mystics is that they believe in and practice a direct communion with their higher natures, whether they refer to this as God or use some other name. <clears throat> and Damodar K. Mavalankar, who was a an early member of the, of the society and he was said to be the only chairler that had total success in the time of HPB and he said to have gone to the masters in Tibet so he's a very highly advanced being he says words can merely clothe the ideas but no number of words can convey an idea to one who is incapable of perceiving it Every one of us has within him the latent capacity or a sense dormant in us which can take cognizance of abstract truth. Although the development of that sense, or more correctly speaking the assimilation of our intellect with that higher sense, may vary in different persons according to circumstances, education and discipline. That higher sense, which is the potential capacity of every human being, is in eternal contact with reality. 
And every one of us has experienced moments when, being for the time en rapport with that higher sense, we realise the eternal verities. The sole question is how to focalise ourselves entirely in that higher sense. How to focalise ourselves entirely in that higher sense. <clears throat> it's very much like Plato saying that all true learning is merely recollection. All true learning is merely recollection. We limit ourselves by misunderstanding what we really are in essence. A theosophical based mystic has an advantage over the sectarian one. He will always clothe any experience they have in the language of their particular religion. Although on a higher level the experience is exactly the same. When they have to try to explain what they've experienced, they will refer, revert to imagery that the lower mind understands. So they will say that they have seen God or, or Jesus or Krishna or something, some other similar deity. Well, this is one of the great advantages of theosophical training is that we are taught to disassociate ourselves from any kind of dogmatism and see things as they truly are. How far each one of us has gone along that road will determine how we translate any experiences. But really, these experiences are beyond words. So it's a bit of a koan, isn't it? Like a Zen koan. <laughs> how do you explain what you can't explain? Uh, books like The Voice of the Silence, The Light on the Path, The Bhagavad Gita, and The Secret of the Golden Flower even, give us pointers and guidance. But in the end, we have to progress by self-induced and self-devised efforts. We are the way and the truth and the life or the light. So what problems does the modern mystic have as he or she tries to focus the attention in this higher self? <clears throat> well, today's society, as I've said, is very much one of communication on a basic level. We have iPhones, <coughs> tablets, PCs, as well as TV, magazines, and immediately we step into a town or city, we are bombarded with advertisements for this and that, and shops are pressing more and more to gain custom. You know, it's very... When I go into a shop, I always feel this urge to buy something. It's like a, the thought forms, isn't it, that are <coughs> in the shop, you know, you think, I must buy this, something totally ridiculous. And when you walk out, you think, what the heck did I buy that for? <laughs> but some, something, uh, you know, pushes us towards it. <coughs> so it is a wonder that we find a space in our lives and minds to contemplate anything higher. And this is why the Masters recommended that we take the kingdom of heaven by force. If by force it means perseverance. And also learning to be in the world, but not of it. We have to learn to find the calm in the centre of the storm. The way is not to retire into a cave and isolate oneself from society, although it is good to get away for periods to recharge our batteries and let nature speak to us. But generally, we must burn away our passions, fears and doubts in the fires caused by the friction between ourselves and others, and therefore gradually overcome the great dire heresy of separateness that weans us from the rest, as HPB says in the Voice of the Silence. And she also says, he who would profit by the wisdom of the universal mind has to reach it through the whole of humanity without distinction of race, complexion, religious or social status. And the new race will be born from the interming intermixing intermingling of different cultures. That's why it's so important that we have a diverse society composed of a number of nationalities and cultures. And this is because everyone has the same origin and the same goal. We must learn to love all beings, and particularly our fellow humans. And this is hard, given some of the terrible things that go on in the world. But we as a society have created the conditions 
that give rise to all the violence that goes on around us. We have created Frankenstein's monster and now it is turning upon us. We have played God without wisdom and without compassion. But deep within this apparent chaos, the self watches and waits. In a way, it is the silent watcher on one level. It is changeless. And if we fight our way through to, through to it, our whole being is flooded with a calm that is communicated to every living being because we are one with everyone and everything else. And we need to overcome this great dire heresy of separateness. We can see from reading the books that I mentioned and others like the Crest Jewel of Wisdom uh, that great souls throughout the ages have realised th this and have comprehended the limitations of what we call or regard as life. Consciousness nowadays is mainly focused on the lower aspects of our being and that is why at times we feel lonely, insecure and afraid. The Victorian Orientalist, Professor Max Muller, writes, In the hymns of the Veda, man invokes the gods around him. He praises and worships them, but still, with all these gods beneath him, the early poet seems ill at ease within himself. There too, in his own breast, he has discovered a power, never absent when he fears and trembles. It seems to inspire his prayers, and yet to listen to them. It seems to live in him and yet to support him and all around him. The only name you can find for this mysterious power is Brahman. So this is saying that the power is within us. And is it not true that despite the gods we have made of money, sensuality and material possessions, as well as the other gods, we are still uneasy within ourselves. We still crave that self that remains harmonious despite all the turmoil. Do we not seek the inner light to guide us, that still small voice of our inner selves? And is this not something worth fighting for? Especially if we realise that our victory pours beneficence on the whole world. This is because, as HPB says, no man or woman can rise superior to his individual feelings and failings without lifting, be it ever so little, the whole body of which he is an integral part. In the same way, no one can sin nor suffer the effects of sin alone. In reality, there is no such thing as separateness and the nearest approach is in the intent and motive. So, we went a little bit more from HPB. Desire is of the lower mind and drags us deeper into matter. But will, and I put cap with capital letters, is of a, of a spiritual kind, is connected to the higher aspects of our mind and leads us towards the spiritual realms of existence and beyond. And HPB wrote concerning this, Will is the exclusive possession of man on this our plane of consciousness. It divides him from the brute in whom instinctive desire only is active. Desire in its widest application is the one creative force in the universe. In this sense, it is indistinguishable from will. But we men never know desire under this form while we remain only men. Therefore, will and desire are here considered as opposed. Thus, will is the offspring of the divine, the God in man, desire the motive power of the animal life. Most of men live in and by desire, mistaking it for will. But he who would achieve must separate will from desire and make his will the ruler. For desire is unstable and ever-changing, while will is steady and constant. Both will and desire are absolute creators, forming the man himself and his surroundings. But will creates intelligently, desire blindly and unconsciously. 
The man therefore makes himself in the image of his desires, unless he creates himself in the likeness of the divine, through his will, the child of the light. And I love that expression, the child of the light, because we grow in the light. And child of the light sounds a lot better if you say we become adults of the light. That doesn't sound quite as poetic. <laughs> but the child of the light, we're, we're, for, we're forever children, aren't we? You know, we're forever, we're forever young. So his task is twofold, to awaken the will, to strengthen it by use and conquest, to make it absolute ruler within his body, and parallel with this, to purify desire. Knowledge and will are the tools for the accomplishment of this purification. End of quote. And of course, knowledge here is, tr is the true knowledge that logs into the higher part of our nature and breaks down all the imaginary barriers between ourselves and this universal self. It is an erroneous focusing of thought that makes us imagine that we are separate from all else. What is thought? Think about that. Where does it come from? Where is it going? Think about desire. On a lower level, it is always for those things that help to increase the illusion of the personal self. The, the I and them, or the us and them scenario. The true mystic will only desire on a higher level, or will to merge him or self into the supreme self, and to therefore realise the divinity in all things. This is where real compassion springs from. The ability to identify with the joys and suffering of humanity without becoming engulfed by them. And to realise what a universal brotherhood really is in its purest and most highest sense. Political brotherhoods are unsteady and it's very much like building our house on shifting sands. Whereas a brotherhood based on true spirituality is like building one's house on a rock where it is stable. So it's a refocusing of our consciousness and a steady centering of that consciousness on the true self that constitutes true meditation. And it is something that eventually needs to be carried on 24 hours a day as we go about our daily business. That doesn't mean walking about in a trance, you know, with a, like, you know, like this earlier. You know, it's doing the, the, the duties of life, um, but having this in the background of our, our consciousness as we do the daily duties of our life. Um, I was trying to think of something that says in the Sushik of the Golden Flower, the two things you have to avoid in meditation are oblivion and distraction. Oblivion and distraction. So it has to make us aware of the transitory nature of the physical world around us. In the light of the spirit, the fear of death is removed, and life becomes worth living if only for the experiences it gives us the opportunities that it gives us. These we label good or bad, but if looked at rightly, they are all helping us to develop so long as we have this right attitude to, you know, to, to life and, and to what goes on. The idea of meditation becomes clear if we take on board the theosophical definition of meditation, which was written in an article, The Elixir of Life. And which is the inexpressible yearning of the inner man to go out towards the infinite. The inexpressible yearning of the inner man to go out towards the infinite. And don't we have this inexpressible yearning? We try to fill it with material things, material goods, uh, find to find the right partner. Do we all do so many different things to fill this, this yearning? But ultimately, there's only one yearning within us, and that's to go out towards the infinite, for this spiritual awakening, for this the golden flower to open, open within our hearts, to let the true spiritual sun shine, shine on us and within us. And like sunflowers, we can turn towards that, that light. Don't sunflowers and flowers always turn towards the sun? So when the flower of our heart opens, can we not turn it towards the spiritual sun, the true sun within us? beyond the physical. The true mystic will reflect on the words of Shankaracharya in the Crest Jewel of Wisdom. O thou high-minded one, 
pass thy time in the perception of the real self everywhere, reflecting on the non-dual self and realising true bliss. To attribute changefulness to the Atman, who is indestructible, wisdom and changeless, is like building a castle in the air. Therefore always attain great peace through the Atman, who is full of non-dual bliss. And keep silence. Silence is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? You know, silence is a... I think it was Ramana Maharishi who said that silence is the greatest eloquence. We learn so much from silence. The way for anyone who would follow the mystical path to reach a state in which they are truly centres is to give up everything to that, that self, to that silence. And this is true devotion. And it is a devotion to that part of us that is unchanging and that we share with everyone. Therefore, it is a devotion to humanity. That's the highest form of altruism, to devote oneself to humanity. And the path of the mystic also returns us to the natural and the spontaneity of our deepest feelings. Spontaneity is also a beautiful thing, if done in the right way. It's like the Zen monk who went for a walk one evening. Suddenly the clouds parted and he saw the moon and he let out a laugh that could be heard for miles. Do not feel like that sometimes when we see or hear something beautiful. Do not feel like laughing out at the wonder of it all. But because of the restraints of society and our conditioning, we deny our natural feelings and pretend to be something we are not. There's nothing weird about mysticism. It is a return to our original nature, a return to innocence. Imagine doing that, walking down the street and seeing the moon and suddenly starting to laugh. You'd probably get locked up. <laughs> People think, there's a madman, there's a madman. And I was saying, the uh, letters me meeting yesterday about the, another saying of Plato, that heaven sent madness is preferable to man-made sanity. <laughs> mm. So we read in many different traditions about becoming like little children to really understand. And many of us try to retain these feelings as we grow older. We try to keep the spontaneous feelings beautifully illustrated in the example of the Zen monk and the moon. But for most of us, a struggle to retain these feelings becomes a fight to regain them. It's like a second childhood, isn't it? Become as little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, the child's start state there was lost. But we are told that a gradual coarsening of our natures is a part of the process of becoming adult. Films, TV and literature that contain foul language, explicit sex and violence are said to be designed for the grown-up. <laughs> and society in general accepts this. An early theosophical letter from the Mahachoan warns that the materialistically, intellectual, intellectual, mo intellectual morally ruins those they ought to protect and guide. And this is as bad, if not worse, than ever. We must indeed become like little children. Not become childish, but childlike. Don't run about, you know, making childish noises and playing with toys. But, oh. um, well, you can if you want. <laughs> um, as the singer Judy Souk says in one of her songs, if we all believe in Wonderland, why do we make it such a hell? If we all believe in Wonderland, how come it's lies we tell? Do we still believe in miracles? Although well, Theosophical Society would say they weren't miracles, but for the sake of this. Do we still believe in miracles? If we can only find the key, could it be there's a wonderland? Please God, there's got to be. <laughs> and what we need to do is gain confidence in the power of this spirit and to understand that it is this that society needs as material and political changes are never permanent. The HPB again wrote in an article, The New Cycle, this spirit is a force that cannot, cannot either be checked or stopped. Those who recognise and feel that this is the supreme moment of their salvation will be carried by it beyond the illusions of the great astral serpent. 
The bliss they will feel will be so sharp and so keen that were they not in spirit detached from their bodies of flesh, this beatitude would wound them like a sharpened blade. It is not pleasure they will feel, but a bliss which is a foretaste of the wisdom of the gods, of the knowledge of good and evil, and the fruits of the tree of life. And later in the same article she says that these words are for the mystically inclined only. If these mystically inclined can grasp the truth and beauty of the spiritual life and live constantly under the guidance of their divine self, then indeed will dawn the day of joy and gladness for humanity. And as we said earlier, we cannot live independently of anyone else. It always amuses me when people say, I want to be independent, I'm independent. Uh, so they get the groceries from a supermarket provided by someone else. And their clothes and household items, all provided by somebody else. And even the place they live is provided by someone else. So it, it is almost impossible to be independent in the true sense. Even if you go in a, in, live in a cave somewhere and grow your own food, it's still nature that's providing. You know? So all this about independence. <laughs> we also have the power to consecrate. And if we are mystically inclined, our main task should be to develop that true love within our hearts that can bring about a heaven on earth and a return symbolically to the Garden of Eden. To do this, we have to find the beauty in the midst of the storm. We have to discover that magical dimension to our being that is unaffected by all of life's trials and tribulations. We have to learn the secret of silence. And I mentioned silence earlier, but silence is all-powerful and pregnant with meaning to those who are aware. When it comes to helping someone in distress, it is quite often the silence that communicates the healing power, more than words at times. Words and images can sometimes divide. A feeling of joy can be passed to someone who is suffering, and no matter what that person's belief, it is equally effective. But if you were to tell an evangelical Christian that you had used an ancient Tibetan Buddhist method of, of, of meditation to communicate peace and healing to them, they would be shocked and all the good effects would be lost. They would probably say that you were working for the devil. <laughs> In such cases, beliefs don't matter. They are secondary. Compassion is what is needed. All else comes after. We must remember that the spiritual path is one of great beauty and of great joy. There are many warnings in our books and the pessimists may dwell on these. But the optimists will take note of them but focus themselves on the positive side. If we think of the path as heavy and hard, we also become heavy and hard. And that is all we can give to others. No matter how much we talk of reincarnation, karma, brotherhood and morality, we are, in fact, in fact, only communicating doom and gloom. But if we see the path as one of light, of light and love and joy and peace, then this is what shines from us, even if we just talk about the weather. This is because, uh, as I said earlier, we are, each one of us, the way, the truth and the light. We are the path. It is not something outside of us. All the teachings are within us. Books and teachings from masters can only awaken us to that fact. We need, we need guides to build up an intellectual understanding and to help arm us against the many dangers that we have to face. But in the end, in the final analysis, it is only our own experience that counts for anything. If we want to communicate with higher beings, we have to become centres of spiritual energy, radiating outward constantly for the good of all. Again, I must say and emphasise, the only way to really survive in the world is to find that spirit within. Earthly loves may pass and, and, or fail. Worldly joys will fade in time. Even pain has its end. All things must pass. Will the spirit endures through the good and the bad times? as we designate them, 
and the harmony of the universe is reflected in our hearts as love and this is the, the only permanent thing in the manifested universe Shakespeare puts it very well in sonnet 116 let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments love is not love which alters when its alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove oh no it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken it is a star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown although its height be taken love's not time's fool though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come love alters not with his brief hours and weeks but burns it out even to the edge of doom if this be error and upon me proved I never writ nor no man ever loved he certainly knew how to, uh, to put things didn't he <laughs> So some of us may be tempted to think, what has all this to do with us, with our day-to-day -day lives? Well, it has everything to do with us as citizens on this planet Earth. We have lost sight of the true dignity of human nature. The fact that we are in reality spiritual beings and the material world that we have made is fast becoming a hell on Earth. <coughs> the planet itself is beautiful. You know, nature, and you look at the planet from from space. It's such a wonderful, wonderful planet, isn't it? And thankfully, there are many people working for the opposite at the moment, in different, like the Peace Marla, for example. <laughs> and thank, we must thank ourselves for, for, for that. But this is due only to mankind. Nature itself has no malice. We have things like earthquakes, volcanoes, tornadoes, etc., which claim many lives. That's just the workings of nature. And how do we know how much of that is, is not caused by the negative energy set in motion by the discordant thoughts of humanity as a whole, or by the destruction of nature by man causing this imbalance? So we only have to pick up the newspaper or turn on the TV to read of some tragedy somewhere in the world perpetrated in the name of, of an imaginary god or for some political belief. The Theosophical Masters again state, our doctrine knows no compromises. It either affirms or denies, for it never teaches but that which it knows to be the truth. Therefore we deny God, both as philosophers and as Buddhists. We know there are planetary and other spiritual lives, and we know that in our system there is no such thing as God, either personal or impersonal. Very strong words. Prabram is not a God, but absolute immutable law, and Ishwar is the effect of avidya, ignorance, and maya, illusion. And this is ignorance based on the great delusion. The god of the theologians, which is the one she's talking about, is simply an imaginary power, un loop guru, pardon my French, <laughs> as Holbach expressed it, a power which has never manifested itself. Our chief aim is to deliver humanity of this nightmare, to teach man virtue for its own sake, and to walk in life relying on himself, instead of leaning on a theological crutch. That for countless ages was the direct cause of nearly all, all of human misery. Later they say that two thirds of the world's evil is a result of organised religion, the other third being selfishness. We can see that um, this is quite true in, 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 if you look through the, the centuries um, with dogmatic religions like the dogmatic side of Christianity and Islam. Both of them, have, of course, have esoteric um, sides that are, are, are really beautiful and good. But on, from, a, from a dogmatic, um, organised religion side, side, it's different. On another level, we read of someone being killed for the sake of a few pounds or for little reason at all. This shows that we as human beings have lost the true meaning of life and cannot relate to each other as spiritual beings with love and with compassion. So what I'm saying today is of vital importance to all of us on this planet because we need to get back to the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount and the Dhammapada, etc. and learn to love our enemies, bless those that curse us and pray for those that despitefully use us. For hatred never ceases by hatred. Hatred only ceases by love. 
This is the eternal law, as the Dharma Pada says. Too long have we been indoctrinated with the idea that we are weak, miserable sinners. <laughs> we are strong, happy, you know, beings. Even though most people will deny being religious nowadays, we have still been tainted with this doctrine. It is in the collective consciousness of us in this country, at least or in, the, in the West generally. That is why so many people suffer from guilt and feel depressed at times. The materialistic society that we live in, the obsession with material goods, does not feed the spirit, does not satisfy the soul hunger, and does not encourage the inexpressible yearning of the inner man to go towards the infinite. But the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. The Zen poet Issa says in a haiku, Sitting under shady trees, resting with a butterfly, even this is karma. A beautiful saying. Sitting under shady trees, resting with a butterfly, even this is karma. Even us sitting in this room is karma. Have you thought of that? Nothing happens by chance as far as we can understand. We have all taken a step, whether the first, the second, the hundredth or the thousandth, or even the last for some, if there ever is a last. We are all divine beings, gods and goddesses in the making. At the centre of that being is the bliss that lies at the heart of the universe. But we have forgotten. We've forgotten. We've got amnesia. We need anamnesis, which is the opposite. It's solar remembrance. As I mentioned earlier, about Plato saying that all meaning, learning is merely recollection. Just remembering who and what we are is the path. The Zen master Banke said that it's not a case of becoming Buddhas, it's a case of remaining Buddhas. Because we're already there, but we're not aware, as I've said before. Um, if you want a golden age back on Earth, we really need to want it. The Theosophical writer Raghavan Ayer um, says, according to Hindu calculations, Kali Yuga began over 5,000 years ago and will last altogether for a total of, ready for it, 432,000 years. And this dark age is characterised by widespread confusion of roles, inversion of ethical values and enormous suffering owing to spiritual blindness. A.E., and she's talking about the Irish theosophist George William Russell, celebrated the myth of the Golden Age as extolling the plenitude of man's creative potential. The doctrine of the Yugas is not deterministic. It merely suggests the relative re levels of consciousness which most human beings t tend to hold in common. Thus a Golden Age vibration can be inserted into an Iron Age, which is the Age of Kali, to ameliorate the collective predicament of mankind. The Golden Age surrounded human beings as a primordial state of divine consciousness, but their own pride and ignorance precluded its recovery. In the wonder of childhood, in archaic myths, in the sporadic illuminations of great artists, and in mystical visions, one may discern shimmering glimpses of the Golden Age of universal Eros, the original rightful estate of humanity. It's wonderful. We also, also all of our golden ages, even in a day, you know, we, have a, we might wake up feeling terrible, that's like the age of Kali, and then we, fell, we have a breakfast and feel a bit better, and we enter a, a golden age for a little while, <laughs> and, and then we, you know, it's all, it's all cycles, within cycles, within cycles, within wheels, within wheels, and from the, heart, from the biggest you can possibly imagine, way out in the universe, to the tiniest little thing, an atom. So it is possible to insert these golden age vibrations in the heart of humanity. St. Francis of Assisi said, let there, be, let there be peace and let it begin with me. That is very important, taking into account that we are all one. The suffering and the joy of the world is ours. We are our brother's keepers. This is the teaching of the, all the world's great mystics, such as Jesus, Gautama, Buddha, Krishna, Plato, Pythagoras etc etc and the theosophical teachings so to recap 
We have to try to awaken ourselves and others to our divine nature, to our natural being. We have to awaken from the dream to see the reality. We need to learn to promote the spiritual man or woman, and not the animal that is so predominant in the society at the moment. We have so much more than we think. We have gained something very precious in our journey, and that is self-awareness. The ability to, to take our progress in, in hand and proceed by, as, as I've said earlier, self-induced and self-devised efforts. And we are able to contemplate the, contemplate the world on a higher level and realise that we are multidimensional beings according to the teachings of the great spiritual teachers of the world. And we should strive towards that understanding, each to the limits of his or her ability. No one's asked to take on more than they, they can. All the masters ask is that we try. The Bhagavad Gita says that all true knowledge reduces ignorance to ashes. And the only knowledge that means anything is that which awakens us to a realisation of this true nature. This is because it is the only knowledge that remains with us permanently through our lives. The Sutra Atma, the thread soul that runs through all our lives and all our lives are like pearls strung upon this golden thread. The essential thing is to hold on to the, to the permanent despite all the changes that we go through inwardly and outwardly. That is the talisman. To become the eye in the centre of the storm. That's what we need to become. Then we can begin to recover an, an enlightened faith in the power of this spirit within. So because we have made material things around us seem indispensable. We have made them see, seem this way and they clutter up our minds and lives. We lose sight of some of the natural things of life that are free. So busy are many people with their heads buried in their mobile phones. Well, in, a, in an edition of the Northwest Federation Journal, I wrote an article called Go Slowly. And I included this poem by William Henry Davis, which some of you may know. And if you do, just sing along. <laughs> or speak along. <laughs> what is this life if full of care? We have no time to stand and stir. No time to stand beneath the boughs and stir as long as sheep or cows. No time to see when woods we pass, where squirrels hide their nuts in grass. No time to see in broad daylight, streams full of stars like skies at night. No time to turn at beauty's glance, and watch her feet so they can dance. No time to wait till her mouth can, enrich that smile her eyes began. Oh poor life, this if, if we if full of care, we have no time to stand and stir. Beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? I should have got you to read it. <laughs> so society cannot be made good through legislation, but by true education, by inspiration, and by being shown a better way to live. We think we are separate, but we all see the world through our own eyes. Does this not give us a clue as to the one thing, oneness of all things? All the world is seen just through one pair of eyes. Think about that. It's something that I, I thought about. That everyone sees the world through their own eyes. It's just one pair of eyes looking at everything. Um, so let's banish the fear of death from our collective consciousness. There is no death, just everlasting life. So let us see only transformation, awakening from our sleep. Remember the Chinese saying from Chuang Tzu, who dreamt he was a butterfly, and when he awoke didn't know he, whether he was a man dreaming he was a, he was a butterfly? Or a butterfly dreaming he was a man. <laughs> There's so much deep meaning in that. We are all dreamers. Let us awaken at last. Thank you. <laughs>